Hi everyone, I am back again with the rest of this lesson on the factor theorem. We're picking up here with example three. So example three, you'll notice I kind of added quotation marks here, is asking you to factor this thing. And the reason I did that is we're not going to be able to factor this thing traditionally. Okay, we've learned all these different factoring methods and still we don't have a method for factoring something like this. We might be able to get away with doing some grouping. Okay, we might be able to pair up these two and these two. Honestly, I've, I've not, I haven't tried it, so it could work. Um, but, you know, even if we took out that GCF of X, they all have an X in common, that would leave me with an X cubed up here, and I really don't have a way to factor things that start with an X cubed. Okay, so normal traditional factoring will not work for me for a question like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about that factor theorem that we talked about, and I'm going to apply it, but I'm going to apply it kind of backwards from what we've done up here. So up here, we were focused first on finding the factors, which is what we did here, okay? And then once we had the factors, we turned those into zeros. I can also apply this theorem the other way, which means that if I have some way of finding the zeros, then I can turn those zeros into the factors. Okay, and that's what I'm doing here. It's kind of a workaround. So how could I find the zeros without factoring? Well, I think the easiest way would be to look at it on a graph. So when I say factor, really what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for zeros on the graph. And then once I have my zeros, I can turn my zeros into factors, okay? So it just so happens that I typed this thing into Desmos just a few minutes ago, and I get a picture that looks something like this. Um, and it's a little bit crazy. It kind of looks like it's just four red vertical lines here. Hopefully you can see that. They're not really vertical. Really, there's kind of like some bumps here, like up at the top of this one. It might bump like this, or it might you know, swoop together like this. So these aren't really vertical, but we're looking at a very, very zoomed in version of this. I could zoom it out, but um, I tried a second ago and it would take a while to zoom it out correctly. So, but that's okay. I don't really care what the rest of this graph looks like. All I really care about is where these zeros are located. And you'll notice those just popped up there in gray. So these four spots are all I really care about. And if I highlight them here, they're located at negative nine, zero, 8, and 15, okay? And you could also find those, if you were doing this on your graphing calculator, you could scroll through your table and look for those as well, just like we did on the last example. So now that I know where my zeros are located, let's go back here. I know I have a zero at negative 9. I have a zero at 0. I have a zero at 8, and a zero at 15. Well, what I can do now is I can say to each one of these, okay, now I can turn you into a factor by doing x minus the zero. If you look at the wording of the factor theorem, actually, let's look at that real quick back here. Okay. If c is your zero, then x minus c is your factor. So you're always doing x minus whatever the zero is. So when I'm working with this negative 9, x minus negative 9 would actually give me an x plus 9. x minus 0, um, I'm going to write it as x minus 0 for now, but I'm going to fix that in just a second. Um, my 8 would become x minus 8, and my 15 would be x minus 15. And there we go. We are now in factored form. Those are my factors, okay? I don't know of any traditional factoring method that would have gotten us there on our own, but really this is your answer. Um, the only other thing you could possibly do with this is x minus 0 is really just x, and usually when we have just a single x, we kind of put it in front, so I could write this thing like this, x times x plus 9 times x minus 8 times x minus 15, okay? Oh, sorry, didn't realize you couldn't see that. But really, that's about it. That would be your final answer. That's all the question's asking you to do. So if you can't factor it, you can always find the zeros using your graphing calculator and then work backwards and turn those things into the factors. Okay, so let's look at example four. Write a polynomial equation in standard form. Um, 
I'm not going to worry about the standard form right now, actually. Okay. We'll talk about that when and if we need to. But I just want to focus on how do we write an equation with these zeros. Well, essentially, I'm doing the same thing I was doing up above. Okay. Um, in the other one, in example three, I had to go find the zeros for myself. This time, they're just telling me what they are. So I'm going to turn each one of these into a factor. So I'm going to make this x minus 4. x minus negative 7 would really be x plus 7. And then I'm going to write this like this for right now, x minus 1 half for that last one. But I want you to know that we shouldn't really leave our answers like that. And the reason is when we factor, we don't ever use fractions and decimals. So if I have x minus 1 half, I want my answer to come out to be 1 half. Just watch what I'm going to do here, and then hopefully it'll make sense to you. But if I take this 2 and slide it over here in front of the x, I'm going to end up with 2x minus 1. And if you think about setting that thing equal to 0 and solving it, you would add the 1 to the other side and then divide by the 2, and you would get x equals 1 half. Okay? So my trick for you is when you're dealing with these fraction ones, you can just grab that bottom number and slide it over in front of the x, and then you'll have a, a normal looking factor, okay? That would still give you an answer of 1 half, okay? So my polynomial equation would just be x minus 4, x plus 7, and 2x minus 1. And that's, that's a polynomial in factored form. Now, if I did want standard form, I would have to multiply these all back together. Okay, I'm not going to mess with that right now. But that's, that's what standard form would imply. So now, write a different equation with the same zeros. Okay, there's, there's a couple different things you could do here with this. First of all, um, in some of the other problems we've done, and maybe not so much on this page, but in some of the other factoring ones you've done, You've had a GCF that you pull out front, and it's just a single number here, right? If you were to have a single number sitting here, that would definitely change my equation, but it wouldn't change where my answers fall because there's no x out there. So one of my possibilities for a different equation would be just to throw any number I want out in front of those parentheses. So x minus 4, what's the next one, x plus 7 and 2x minus 1. Okay? So that's a possibility to do something like this. And it doesn't have to be 3. It can be any number you want. So you can make an infinite number of equations. They'd all be a little bit different, but they'd all have zeros in the same place. Okay? Your other option would be to use what's called multiplicity. And we talked about that a little bit in the last video. But make it so that you have more than one copy of one of these factors. So I could, for example, do this, x minus 4 squared times x plus 7 times 2x minus 1. Now I have what's called a multiplicity with this root, meaning I have multiple copies of it, but it's still the same answer, right? It's still x equals 4 as a possible answer. So this is another option for you, is to add exponents on the factors that you already have. So I just want to show you real quick. Let's go back to my friend Desmos here. I'm going to put in that first equation we talked about. So we originally had x minus 4. Whoops, meant to get rid of all that. x minus 4 times x plus 7 times 2x minus 1. Okay, so that's where my zeros are located. If I take that exact same thing, but put it down here and throw maybe a 3 in front of it like we did. Um, let's see, you should be able to see the red as well. So eh, it's kind of hard to tell here, maybe if I zoom out a little bit. Um, there's a very minor difference, but you can see a little bit of overlap here that not having that 3 there kind of changes the steepness. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard to see on this graph. There we go. If I move it this way, you can see a little bit more of a dramatic difference. So these are different functions, right? These are two different equations. Um, 
but based on how they're written, they're going to still have zeros in the exact same spots. Okay, that might be more dramatic if I did something like a 10. Okay, now you can start to see it a little bit sooner, right? There's a difference between the blue and the red. Okay, the other thing we did there was we took, for example, this parenthesis and we squared it. Now that's going to change the total shape of the graph. So look at the red compared to the green. Okay, notice especially right here, and this is on that x equals 4 one that I located before. Um, see how this green one kind of hits the line and then comes back up, whereas the red one goes straight through it? That's what the effect of that multiple root thing is. If I were to do that to the x plus 7, if I were to square that one, then over here at the negative 7, you'll see now my graph hits the hits the x-axis and then turns back around the other way. Okay, But it still has the same zeros, so that does answer our question. The question was just write me another equation with the same zeros. And so that's what I've done. Okay. All right, that's really about it for today. So um, possibly another couple of questions and go formative for you. Um, but then you are just moving on to your Lesson Master 11.5, and we'll go over this in class tomorrow.